Welcome, everyone. Uh, my name is Tanya. I'm your moderator for this session. Today's uh, workshop is Working with Data in a Connected World, the Power of Graph Data Science with Dr. Claire Sullivan. Hi and uh, welcome, Claire. I just give a, I just give a short introduction. Claire has a doctorate degree in nuclear engineering from the University of Michigan. Afterwards, she started her career in nuclear emergency response and also worked in the federal government before returning to academic research in 2012 as an assistant professor. And there she focused more on machine learning and afterwards also worked as GitHub as a machine learning engineer and just this year joined Neo4j as a graph data science advocate. She also founded a company, Lanesh Analytics, who uh, provides data science expertise to the skiing industry. Furthermore, she has authored several book chapters, peer-reviewed papers and conference papers, and received some awards for her impressive, impressive, achievement, <laughs> impressive achievements. <laughs> Claire, uh, thank you for being with us and the stage is yours. All right. Well, um, first, I just want to say thank you, Tanya, and the, I want to thank the organizers of PyData Global. I'm really excited to be here. Um, so good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever I might be happening to talk to you from. And um, today we're going to be talking about working with connected data and the power of graph data science. And um, I want to mention, um, as you know, we have a Slack channel set up for the tutorials. This is probably where I'm going to be able to find most of you, given our Zoom challenges. So if you could uh, take your questions to that channel, um, and that's where, where we'll be doing things. This slide I am going to be putting up several times during our workshop today. So um, you'll also notice at the bottom is the GitHub repo for this tutorial. So um, we'll be working with that repo today. There's a lot of resources in there, and I will say yes, including the slides. That seems to be one of the biggest questions uh, that we get in these online uh, conferences. So, um, and if you want to get a, a link to that repo, it's also in the channel for today's tutorial. So first things first, I like to get an idea of who all um, is in the audience today. So if you could maybe go to that channel now, um, and I have two survey questions that we'll respond to with emojis. And the first one is <clears throat> just kind of am curious where you're at in your data science journey and you know when I know that answer um, it really helps me to to kind of figure out how to uh, present the material on the fly and then the second one is what's your what is your current knowledge of graphs we're going to be working with network graphs today um, so these are good things to know so I'm just going to give you know a minute here for everybody to to go in um, pick an emoji any emoji So the, uh, I am not a data scientist, but I work with them. That could be data engineers, that could be infra folks, that could be uh, business folks who are on the receiving end of the results data scientists produce. So maybe 15 more seconds on this one. Okay, let's move on. We've already done our survey thing here and feel free to keep filling that out. <clears throat> Excuse me. So by the end of this tutorial, we're going to be able to understand relative graph data science theory. You know, so we've got to understand a little bit of graph theory. We're not going to spend a huge amount of time there, but but hopefully you get enough feel for it. Um, we'll learn how to import a graph from a CSV file into a graph database. Now, the thing I'm going to say about that, we're going to be using um, Neo4j as the graph database. It's free. It's easy to stand up. But a lot of what I'm talking about today doesn't actually need to be done. Um, within Neo4j, there's, there's functions out there that can achieve a lot of what we're looking to do um, in different Python packages like NetworkX, different graph databases. I'm using this one just for simplicity. Um, <clears throat> we're going to create some simple machine learning models based on traditional machine learning approaches, and then we're going to compare them to how they work in, um, in a graph context. And then we're going to use those models to understand the results of those two types of embeddings using some pretty common techniques um, and Python packages. So 
what are we going to do today specifically? Um, we're going to talk about why graphs. Why not just use SQL? This is one of the most common questions I get is, hey, I can do queries in SQL. Why do I need to learn this whole new method of querying? Um, so we'll talk a bit about that. Um, how do I know if I have a graphy problem, graphy in quotes? Um, it's, you know, a lot of people don't realize it, but the problems that they're looking to solve in data science actually would be much easier to solve with a graph. Um, we're going to do just a really quick introduction to graph theory, and then we're going to get right into graph machine learning learning and dive into some code. Feel free to code along. If you just want to watch, that's fine too. Whatever, whatever floats your boat. Um, and then we'll have a brief wrap up. Reminder again, here's the Slack channel. Um, this is where we'll be taking all of our questions. And um, here is the GitHub repository. Again, that repository is linked within the Slack channel for this workshop. Okay, and the slides are in the repository. So I like to start uh, workshops and tutorials with what I call two key concepts. And what that means is if you take nothing else away from this tutorial, these are the two things that I hope you can you, you take away. The first um, is it, it can be really good for us to break this assumption that individual data points are independent. That's kind of one of the fundamentals, if you think about it, about data science. You know, we have columnar data where we have rows and there's columns associated with those rows, and we assume no relationship between those rows as we make our models. But today we're going to break that um, because we know in certain contexts there are relationships between rows, and I'll give you examples of that as we go along here. Second, um, modeling these relationships uh, can, not always, but can result in uh, models and signals that are less noisy and more accurate. So I, I'll show you examples of that as we go through the coding portion, but those are the two key things that I'd like you to take away. Okay, so now we're going to dive into the graph theory portion of today. What is a graph? Well, simply put, it's things connected to other things. So these could be people connected to other people. They could be network routers. Um, this router goes to that router. They could be supply chains. Um, this uh, shipment is going to this location. Um, so really it's any, any bit of data connected to any other bit of data. And they appear, graphs appear in all kinds of places, obviously social networks. Um, but internet routing, maps and wayfinding. You know, we can say that this city is connected to this other city by this freeway. Um, so we can do shortest path and efficient paths just by, you know, this is what Google does when you say, hey, what's the most, what's the quickest way to get me from point A to point B? Um, recommendation systems, a lot of, I, when I was at GitHub, we created a recommendation system that was not at all built on graphs, but in fact, it can be much more efficient to do it with graphs. Um, search knowledge graphs, question answering systems, think about Alexa, Siri, um, Google. Google search is based off of graphs, and we'll talk about that one specifically in a bit. Okay. Why? Why would we do this? Why, why are we going to go down this path and add what we might think of as more complexity? Um, this here is just a, a figure that I took from Kaggle. This was a Kaggle challenge a while back, trying to predict churn. And you know, you've got columns and rows, and we've got information about each of those rows, which corresponds to a person. And we're trying to predict that column all the way on the right, whether the person um, exited from the company. And um, we've got information like what country they're in, what their gender is, their age, etc. Um, and that's all well and good. But let's say we knew that two of these people were friends. Okay, so let's let's look at this in maybe a social graph context. A social graph around Barack Obama. Okay, and Barack Obama is friended with different people such as Michelle Obama, um, Nancy Pelosi, Joe Biden, um, maybe indirectly to Mitch McConnell, who knows. Um, but let's we, we know that he has a strong connection between himself and his wife, Michelle. Now, let's say Michelle decides she doesn't like this social media platform. Okay, so she's going to get off. Well, 
what then do we think is the probability that Barack Obama will leave that social media platform? So instead of having these two rows, one representing each of those two people, we see that there's a connection here and that the probability of Barack Obama turning from this social network increases because Michelle Obama did. Okay. Um, so here's another one, a recommendation engine. Um, and I like to tell this story. I recently built my house, um, not me personally, my general contractor did, but um, I'm talking to you from high in the mountains of Colorado. I'm at 10,200 feet or 3,100 meters, pick your unit of choice. And um, when we were building the house, we were going to a big box hardware store somewhat regularly, and they could learn things about my purchasing habits, such as, well, Claire bought a whole bunch of wood and nails. Maybe that means Claire's building a house. And then we see that Claire bought windows and siding. Okay, now we're getting pretty sure that Claire's building a house. So we're going to start recommending things for her that she could buy along the different stages of building a house, maybe wiring and plumbing parts, lighting, things like that. Well, it turns out that one of the things that was recommended to me was a mailbox. Okay, I didn't buy the mailbox. And, you know, I so that meant I stopped following this pattern of what users do when, you know, customers do when they're building a house. And the question is why? You know, obviously I need to get my mail. However, what this hardware store neglected to realize was that where I live doesn't actually have mail service. I have to use a post office box in town. And so had they looked at all of my neighbors within my subdivision, my geographic vicinity, I have connections to these neighbors and none of them bought mailboxes either. Now, this is a true story. None of the people in my county own have mail service and yet this big box store has a whole shelf in a row that's dedicated to mailboxes and that shelf is collecting dust so they spent a lot of money stocking their shelves with something that had they just looked at the relationships among people within my area to realize none of us had bought machine or bought mailboxes might have saved them some money okay Let's move on. Um, I'd like to just remind you here that we are doing questions within the Slack channel. The Slack channel is called Working with Data in a Connected World, the Power of Graph Data Science. Okay, so how do I know if I have a so-called graphy problem? That's the technical term, graphy. Um, there's a rule of thumb that I like to tell people, and that is if you are doing something in SQL um, and you have more than a couple joins, maybe you're doing it in pandas, whatever, but you have more than a couple joins, so you're joining on a few different tables or several different tables, um, this is a hint that you have a graphy problem. Now, um, Paco Nathan gave a great talk yesterday, and he was showing these really common complicated joins on, you know, SQL tables with their schema and whatnot. And it's really hard to intuitively understand what's going on there by looking at it. So if you have more than a couple SQL joins. So let's play, oh yeah, um, we're gonna play a game here. We're gonna play, will it graph? Okay, will it graph is, do I have a graphy problem here? Um, for those of you familiar with the will it blend uh, web uh, YouTube channel. So a lot of us, many of us are familiar with the traditional MNIST challenge. It's a neural network challenge where we look at um, handwritten digits and images and we try to predict what number they are. So will it graph? Well, the answer is yes. When you're talking about images, Assuming that you're not talking about random noise in an image, the, the pixels nearby other pixels have a relationship to them. There's some continuity there, and that relationship can be modeled with a graph. Okay, let's look at another one here. Facial recognition. Will it graph? Well, if you think about it, faces are connected as well. The different points, the dif different geographical points along your face are connected, and that can be modeled with a graph. Natural language processing. Um, we're actually going to do some natural uh, basic NLP later today. Um, will it graph? Well, the answer is yes. There are relationships between words. Words are connected to other words through things like verbs and, um, you know, how um, adjectives describe words. So there is a connection. We can do natural language processing with a graph. Um, so let's hit some basic graph theory now that we've seen what we can graph. Let's look at how we can graph it. 
Um, first, we're going to talk about directed versus undirected versus weighted graphs. Now, what I'm showing here on the left is an undirected graph. Think of Facebook or Meta or whatever they changed its name to yesterday. Um, I'm going to call it Facebook. So think about Facebook where you're friended with other people. There is, there is no relationship there. If you're friended with them, they're required to be friended with you. That's how that social media platform works. Um, I can have different node types. Um, so my note, we call those circles nodes. We call the lines between them relationships or edges. Nodes are sometimes called vertices. Um, so my nodes are the circles and maybe my different node types, maybe blue corresponds to people and green corresponds to groups on Facebook and maybe red corresponds to organizations or something like this. So um, that's that's nodes and relationships. Now here we've now changed to a directed graph where we don't have to have two people friended together like Facebook. So Twitter is more of an example of this. I can follow somebody on Twitter, but they don't have to follow me back. Okay. Now, um, we also can add this concept, concept in called a weighted graph. And what the weights do is they indicate the strength of connection between my nodes. So a stronger connection would have a higher weight. For example, you see the blue node in the center and the blue node at roughly one o'clock. Um, and that has a really strong connection. It might indicate, for instance, how many times those two people communicate with each other. Or in the opposite sense, it could indicate, say, route finding. This, these two nodes are going to take 10 minutes to get to each other. Or let's like, actually, let's look at the blue node and the two red nodes. Um, I can go to my lower red node either directly, which will take me eight minutes, or I can go to the upper red node, six plus one is seven. So it would actually be faster to go that way. Okay, monopartite versus bipartite. Um, what this means is how many different node types do I have in my graph? So on the graph on the left, I have people which are shown as dark blue, and I have TV shows which are shown as light blue, and this is a weighted graph. Um, so this is who views which TV show. Um, you know, and then uh, the weights here in this particular figure indicate the number of episodes that that person has watched. Um, <clears throat> so that's a bipartite graph. Now we can convert that through graph modeling into a monopartite graph where we have all of the same type of nodes. Um, and in this case, what we've done is we've looked at how many shows do two people have in common. So for instance, we've got Anne and Bev, and they have one show in common, and that would be Farscape, as you can see on the left. Um, we have Bev and Evan, who have two shows in common. So they have, let's see, Farscape, uh, I don't see where the second one is. Oh, Firefly, of course. Um, so th that's the difference between a monopartite and a bipartite graph. And I want to call your attention to this book that's highlighted in red. This book, these figures actually come from this book. And this book describes all of the different types of graph theory. We're only barely scratching the surface today, but this is a great book. It goes into graph algorithms and it does it in two different places, Apache Spark and Neo4j. Apache Spark has some libraries, um, graph frames being one of them, uh, GraphX being another one. So you can see how you would do these uh, different graph algorithms in both platforms, if that's of interest to you. Okay. And then um, here's just uh, creating a projection of just the television shows, how many um, the weights are, how many active viewers and uh, active views do they have between the two of them. So um, just uh, graph modeling is a whole art unto itself. There's all kinds of videos out there on YouTube and whatnot on how to do it. Now, why does this work? Why, why can we do math on a graph? Because we can turn a graph into all kinds of different mathematical constructs, such as an adjacency matrix. The adjacency matrix for the graph that you see here on the left is shown on the right. And what I have is rows and columns where I'm showing the relationships between two nodes. For example, let's go to row A, or uh, column A, row B. So we see the one there indicates that there is a relationship of going from B, the, the row, to the column A. Um, you could think of this in a directed 
an undirected context, and what you would have is something that's symmetric about the diagonal. Um, so we can do this also um, looking at degree. How many degrees does each node have? Which means how many things, how many relationships coming in and out of it does that node have? Now we could talk about in degree, in degrees, just how many nodes are coming in, out degree, how many nodes are going out. So we can see that A here, if you were to count the number of arrows associated with A, you get eight. So I have a diagonal matrix here showing the degree of each of the nodes. Um, Okay, now what can we do with these things? Well, we could look at degree centrality. These are different um, metrics here that I'm showing of which which nodes here are the most important in the graph. And there's all kinds of different ways that you can measure that. Um, if you go online and look for a uh, YouTube series called Bite Sized Neo 4J for Data Scientists, this is a little video series that I've done. And my most recent episode, which was released yesterday, talks all about centrality calculation. So degree centrality, which nodes have the most um, relationships associated with them. And that in this case would be A, because it's got the most arrows coming in and out. Between this centrality, now this is a little different. Between this centrality, I like to explain, uh, think about your office space and you've got the big boss person and you wanna talk to the big boss person. Well, one way you could do it is you could kind of do this circuitous route talking to this friend and that friend who maybe plays tennis with the big boss person. But that's not the most efficient way to do it. The most efficient way would be to go to the administrative assistant of the big boss person. Everybody goes to that person. Um, that person is the gatekeeper to the big boss person and probably a lot of other boss people within your office. So that person we have, we say has highest between this centrality because they're the bridge between other nodes. Um, and then there's this thing called PageRank. And PageRank is the algorithm that was made famous by Larry Page, and it was the basis for early on Google. So what we look at, um, this was done for web pages linking to other web pages, and we identified, or Larry Page did, um, which web pages were the most important by what it linked, what linked to them. Now you'll see here the yellow node, and that yellow node is large, and that size is going to indicate large page rank in this case. And the yellow node has a large page rank because lots of other nodes link to it. Unlike, say, those green nodes on the bottom right, there's not they they link to some things, but nothing links to them, so they're not very important. Now you have the red node on the upper right, doesn't have a lot of uh, arrows coming in and out of it. But why is it so big? Well, it's so big because that really big yellow node linked to it. So an important node linked to it, therefore its page rank is high. So that's page rank. Um, community detection is a common thing that we can do within graphs. Um, it's, it's pretty cool. We can look at uh, communities in all kinds of different ways. Like you could say, okay, well, I've got this cluster here of nodes that are all linking together and not a lot of nodes linking to this other cluster, which is all densely connected. Um, we can look at label propagation. There's all kinds of ways that we could do community detection. Um, and it's, um, it's based on the math within the graph. So, um, Let's talk a little bit. Um, I'm just going to quickly pause and remind people that if you have questions, please bring them into the Slack channel. The Slack channel is called Working with Data in a Connected World, the Power of Graph Data Science. Probably easiest just to find, just to do a search in Slack on channels, type in working and it will come up. So um, let's move along. Now, we know within traditional data science, we've got data that's represented in ones and zeros or floats. And, and the whole idea here is that we're converting, say, a person within our data set to a list of things. We, we convert, our goal is to convert, convert things to numbers. Um, think about natural language processing. We have sentences, we do um, word to vec on these sentences or um, you know any number of tfidf we're, we're converting a sentence into a string of num or, or a list of numbers that re th those things require require sequential understanding of our data this word this word this word and then that word but what is sequence in a graph there is no direction with a graph so what we have to do with graph embeddings which we will do today is we are going to do things like hop randomly around our graph okay um and in that way it's kind of uh very similar to how you do node to vec where you hop around a sentence um 
and you assemble your vector or your embedding that way by looking at the sequence to sequence patterns of words here. In this case, our sequence to sequence is going to be a randomized pattern moving around our graph. Okay, so um, this is just how we're going to turn a graph into numbers, and then we can use those numbers um, in any of our traditional machine learning approaches. <clears throat> a couple things that we learn uh, when we do this, there's two different ways that you could create graph embeddings, transductive versus inductive. Now, transductive means that every time I put a new node into my graph, I need to retrain my embeddings versus inductive means that I can put my node in there and I don't have to retrain. As you can imagine, inductive takes longer to generate an embedding as transductive does. Um, we do a lot of matrix factorization when we create these embeddings, but that's why they can be efficient is because all we're doing is matrix math. <clears throat> we're gonna be talking today about an algorithm called FastRP, fast random projection. So this is, all it is, is matrix multiplication. I'm multiplying my adjacency matrix by my degree matrix and doing some weighting and it's it all comes out. Um, so, and then there are other methods based on neural networks to create these embeddings. A lot of times you have those behind, you know, under the hood, you don't see them, but they're there. Okay, so then if you look at the right, our goal is to take that high dimensional non-Euclidean space and just create a row of numbers and embedding, just like any other embedding that we would use in machine learning. Okay. Now, what can we do with those embeddings? Well, like I said, all of the same machine learning algorithms, what we're gonna do is we're gonna dump them just into basic scikit-learn, and we're gonna do some basic classification. Um, you could do binary classification, multi-class, multi-label, whatever floats your boat. Um, we can do regression. Regression can do things like, um, well, I'll get to it in a minute, link prediction. Clustering, um, I talked about different clustering earlier, Levain clustering um, and all of that. So we can, we can do clustering, think KNN or something like that, just based on those embeddings. Um, especially useful if we don't have labels for them. So today, the data we're gonna work with does have labels. So we're gonna hopefully make that a bit easy on ourselves. Um, dimensionality reduction, just like you can have a high dimensional space with your other embeddings, word embeddings, whatever, you can drop that dimensionality of those embeddings through something like principal component analysis or T distributed stochastic uh, TSNE forgot the acronym. Okay, but you can do that um, also with graph embeddings. Um, similarity, very common thing that we would do with graph embeddings. Which, which node is most similar to which other node? That could be used in something like um, doing a recommendation engine. Well, um, Tanya and Claire might be very similar together. Why? Because their cosine, the cosine between their two embeddings is, is small uh, or is large. Um, so my cosine being closer to one means that those two nodes are most similar to each other. So same thing as we would do with other vector embeddings in our other traditional machine learning in our row column approach. Um, and then um, we can do some things that are unique to graphs. For example, link prediction. Um, let's say I have two people in my social media or my social network um, what's the probability that they're friends? So like you go on to Facebook and they recommend friends to you. Well, the algorithm that's behind the scenes there is link prediction. So I can use my graph embeddings to predict a probability that those people might be interested in linking up. Um, and then sub uh, graph or subgraph level structural similarity. Um, this one, a good example is you can use molecules molecules are graphs okay and so you know maybe think of a big complicated one like dna well what structural similarity do i have just in this small part of that dna molecule um, to to say oh you know here's a gene variant that's similar to this other gene variant or you know i've got two different bits of dna this gene here is the same as that gene there so that's not something that would be very easy to do in traditional machine learning Okay, so we're going to do some coding now. Um, I, let me just go right here. I'm going to remind you that um, we're taking questions within the Slack channel. I am having a difficult time making Zoom work. Zoom does not play well with Linux, which is what I use. So um, let's, let's take our questions to this particular Slack channel. 
This is the repository for what we're doing today. That repository is linked in the Slack channel. Um, so yeah, let's talk about the data set we're gonna use as we get to coding here. This data set is called the Cora data set. It's a pretty common graph uh, data set. It's looking at citations, specifically scientific publications within data science. In this data set, there are 2,708 publications and they fall into seven different classes. And um, so that means we have a multi-class problem. Somebody's gone through and hand labeled these things. Um, in that data set, there are 5,429 citation relationships. And those are the things that we're going to use for our graph portion of the problem. But we're also going to do this as traditional machine learning, meaning um, we're going to look at some data that is that comes with this data set. Somebody created some word vectors associated with the abstracts. Um, so they did some sort of NLP process and they one hot encoded the words um, to a dictionary of 1,433 words. Now, I don't have access to that dictionary, so we just kind of have to go with the vectors that they have provided in this database. And what we have here on the bottom is um, a graph model. Now, I've received a question, what is one hot? Well, when we have a dictionary, let's say we have the word um, machine learning. Okay, now if the words machine, if the word machine is present, I give it a one in the spot for machine um, in in my vector. Now let's say the word learning is not present. So learning corresponds to this column, <clears throat> it gets a zero. Um, and so in that way, they've created this dictionary to say, is this word present? Is this word present? Is this word present? Um, so that's just the one hot encoding um, to create these vectors. So what we wind up with, um, each paper is going to have an ID associated with it, which is just an integer. We don't get the paper titles or anything like that in this data set. And then it has a subject. The subject is that class that I had before. So we're going to see things like neural networks, reinforcement learning, theory, things like that as these classes. Now a paper, the relationship between one paper and another paper is a citation. So, um, you know, I've written a lot of uh, scientific papers before and like I'll cite, you know, here's the canonical work in this field. Okay, so that's the relationship that we're going to use. Now, I like this data set for this class because it allows us to do both traditional machine learning and uh, graph machine learning, but there's tons and tons of other data sets out there. You'll find though that a lot of graph papers, a lot of graph theory papers use this Cora data set as kind of their benchmark. Okay, if you would like to code along today, we're going to be using Google Colab, um, and I'm, I'll show you how to get it set up here in a minute. Um, just a nice platform, very similar to Jupyter Notebooks if you've never used it, I'll show you how. Um, we're also going to be creating a free graph database um, on what we call the Neo4j sandbox. A lot of uh, graph databases out there, <clears throat> they provide you know a free free way to interact with it. Um, this is the one we're going to be using. I'll show you how to set it up. And again, here's the repository. It is linked within the Slack channel. Just as a reminder, that's the place to take our questions. That's the Slack channel right there. That's the repo right there. OK, let's let's do it. Let's get started. So find my mouse here. OK, now I'm going to just show you the repository here um, and what we have, I, I have a lot of information in here, um, the introduction to the course, but the thing I want to point out is I've got a whole bunch of resources at the bottom here. Um, you know, that book that I referenced earlier, which is great on graph theory and graph algorithms, um, how to create a Neo4j sandbox, Google Colab, all these things. We've got some cheat sheets down here um, that are going to help us out here in, in a minute. Um, so the first thing that we are going to need to do is we're going to need to create our graph database. So what we're going to do is we're going to go to sandbox.neo4j.com. Okay, um, it, it's, it might ask you for a name and an email address, just, you know, give it whatever you want. Okay, so I'm going to give you a, a minute to go fire that up. Okay. 
And I'd like to ask, by the way, while you're getting that fired up, if you are seeing questions that are coming by in Zoom chat or you're asking questions in Zoom chat, you know, please, pre please bring them um, into our Slack channel. But I also really encourage, especially as we get to the coding part, if people are asking questions and you know the answer, let's make this interactive. Let's make this fun. It's a lot more fun when people are helping each other out in this thing. Okay, so sandbox.neo4j.com, and if you're having a hard time finding it, just go to the repo down into the helpful uh, resources section, and it's that second bullet point. Let me actually blow this up in case it's hard to see over Zoom. So create a Neo4j sandbox. Okay, so um, what we're going to start with is we're going to create a new project. So click on that new project button. Okay, and what we see here, we've got a whole bunch of different things that we could use. We have some pre-populated databases here. A lot of people get started on this thing called the movies database. That's a great one for beginners. Um, today, we're actually going to scroll down and you see this thing that says your own data and we're going to click on blank sandbox. So if you click there and then you're going to go down to the lower left and there's a blue button here called create. So we're just going to hit create. It's going to take it a minute. Okay, now we have this thing started up. We have our own free database fired up here. Let's click on this little arrow here. Um, it's going to open up some information for us. Um, one of the most important things that we're going to see here is this thing called connection details. Okay, so that's that second thing to the, the second thing to the right, just right of actions. And what we have here, this is we have the IP address or the bolt URL to our sandbox. We're going to be grabbing that there a lot today. Um, so you're going to get to see how we work with that many times. And then we have a password here. Um, it's going to be a randomly generated three word password. We have this username. Our username is always going to be Neo4j. Okay, so now just for fun, click the open button here on the right. Okay, um, what the open button does is it fires up this thing called the browser. You could choose to interface with Neo4j all using this browser. Um, we're going to be interfacing it, uh, with it mostly with Python, um, but we're just gonna, I'm just going to show you a few things quickly here. We're going to populate our database from the browser. If you are getting something like a 404 error or it's just not doing anything like you don't see this little green scrolling bar here um, that's fine just reload your browser okay sometimes it takes a second to fire up now let me zoom in here you'll see it's asking me for a username and a password so i'm going to type my username which is neo4j now i'm going to go back here and I'm going to get my password, so salvages sack dawns, and I can just copy that. Open gives bad gateway. Yes, um, just refresh your browser, um, and it can take a minute. So I'm going to copy my password, just copy and paste it into that, and I'm going to click connect, and it might take a second. Okay, now it says I'm connected. So let me just walk you around this browser a little bit. I can click here and I can see my database information. In this case, I have no data in it. It created us a blank database. Um, I've got no node labels, no relationships. That's all well and good. Okay, but we need to obviously populate our database with some useful data, in particular the Quora data. So let me take you over to back to our repository and I'll show you where we're gonna find this data here. Okay, so in the repository, if you click on notebooks and then data, what I could could you stop for a bit? We're lagging behind you. Yeah, let me let me give you a minute. Great idea. I'm just gonna um, just gonna give you a minute. Get those databases fired up. I'm gonna grab a sip of water. While we're waiting for the browser to spin up. I'm going to show you what our data looks like. Um, 
we're going to be using CSV files. There's all kinds of ways that you can bring um, your data into Neo4j. CSVs are the easiest way. They're not always the fastest way, but it's just going to get us started here. Now, this is, like I said, the Quora data set, and it's frequently convenient, if you can, to organize your data in two different files or more. You would like one file that just describes your nodes and one file that describes your relationships. Now, when I say you could have multiple files, if you have multiple types of relationships, try and make a CSV for each type of relationship. It's just going to save you some time down the road. Let's look at one of these data files. I'm going to pull up the nodes list here. It's a pretty big file, um, so let's just go view raw on this thing. And the thing I want to call to your attention is this is the um, uh, this right here is the CSV header. And what I have are three columns. I have subject, features, and ID. Now we know these are all papers. All of our nodes are papers. Um, and what I have here, there's an ID, which is kind of down here. Let me zoom in on this a touch. Okay. Okay. So my ID is, is all the way down here. Um, it's just an integer. And then I have um, neural networks is my subject for this particular paper. And then features. Now what features is, um, features is that vector of the, um, the, the word vector. So it's those one hot encoded word vectors that the, the owners of the course data set already created. Again, I don't know what these words correspond to, but that's fine. We're just going to be running this model here. And you can see it's ones and zeros. It's very sparse. Um, I've got zeros if, uh, you know, if that particular word did not occur, I've got ones. Um, if that one did. Um, so <clears throat> just uh, just that those are the three things that are in this um, in these features here. All right. Um, I see there are still people having problems with the browser. Jim, could you tell us if you're seeing the green scroller bar or if you're just getting like a blank screen or a 404? Um, just let us know what you're seeing there. Okay, and while we're waiting to hear that, let me show you what the relationships file looks like. Okay, so that's coraedges.csv. No errors, it just takes time. Okay, yep, just, we'll just give it a minute here. Um, what we see is we've got a column called source and a column called target. Okay, so you can imagine source is citing target. Um, we had that graph model before that we showed. Um, so let's, uh, okay, um, we see that people are refreshing their browser. Um, so each paper has only one and only one subject. That is correct. Um, makes it easy on us. It's still multi-class. We still have seven different classes, but we're not doing multi-label, okay, which is one of the reasons that I chose this data set. Um, Okay, so that's our data set. Now, I'm going to just go back to the top of the repository here because we want to get um, our data within to our Neo4j sandbox. Okay, I have created some cipher queries to do this. Now, let me explain what that means. Uh, Neo4j and graphs tend to have their own query languages. In this case, um, the query language that Neo4j uses is called Cypher. Um, in case you haven't noticed, we like the matrix at Neo4j, so a lot of our things are named after characters in the matrix. We have a character, or we have a library called APOC. Um, all right, so what we're going to do is we're going to click into the um, Cypher queries subfolder, and there's one file here populate Cora db dot c q l l which stands for cipher query language okay now the first thing that we're going to do it's almost like we're providing an index for our sql database in this case we call them constraints okay and constraints uh what we're telling it here create constraints we're going to call that constraint a paper or papers if not exists and we've got this thing here, these round uh, parentheses called um, P paper. What does that mean? That means uh, the round parentheses represent nodes. 
Okay, this is, we're gonna create ASCII art here, actually. That's how we're gonna do our graph queries. Um, and we're gonna say that the ID of my paper P, so that's a variable, that little P, the ID is unique. Okay, so what that does, there's, I don't have two nodes with paper ID 42. Okay, what I'm gonna do, if, you're, if you've got your browser going, is I'm just gonna copy this line and paste it into my browser. I can click on my browser window. Okay, so copy and paste. And then to run it, I can click this blue arrow all the way to the right, or I can hit Control Enter. Now, unfortunately, Control Enter works in Neo4j, Shift Enter works in Jupyter or Google Colab notebooks. Um, it is what it is. Okay, now it says I created one constraint on this thing called paper. So you can see now I'm gonna have these nodes, node labels called paper. Okay, cool. Now let's bring in our data. We're gonna do the node list first. Okay, so what we're going to tell load CSV is the command to bring in CSV files into Neo4j. Okay, and we're gonna do it row by row. We're gonna call a row a line in this case. And we're, for every paper, Every row represents a paper, and it has a property. These squiggly braces are properties um, within the O4J. So it's got a property called ID. Line.ID just represents which column within our CSV file we're bringing in. And when we create that paper on create set, we're going to set another property here called subject. Remember those subjects were our classes, the seven classes of paper types, and it's the subject column of line. Okay, and I'm going to set another property called features that, um, to line dot features. Those are those word vectors. And then I'm just going to return the count of all of those things that we bring in. Okay, so I'm going to copy lines five through nine from the repository into my browser. Okay. I'm going to hit control enter to run it now this is going to take a second it's um it's pulling in those csv files that i was showing you before in this case this was the the nodes file that we're pulling in um, i can open my little thing over here and eventually what we're going to see is that i'm going to wind up with like 2708 nodes okay there they are okay now let's go back to our query file we're going to load in our edge list, and this is similar to how we had um, our nodes, how we created nodes, but what we're going to do is we're going to match the source column here, and we're going to have a variable called source, and it's of node type paper. Okay, this is just, this is some basic cipher for you. We don't have time to get into too much cipher. I'm going to show you some examples today. Um, now we're going to merge a relationship. So here's how we specify a relationship. This is kind of cute. So I've got my round parentheses. Remember, round parentheses are nodes. And then I've got square brackets. And inside the square bracket, I have the type of my relationship. So in this case, I'm calling the relationship sites. Okay, and then I've got my target here. Now check this out. Um, I've created arrows. So what I'm indicating here is I have a directed relationship from source to target. So that's kind of fun. All I've done is I've drawn a relationship. Um, and so we're gonna copy lines 12 through 17 into our browser. I'm gonna hit Control Enter. It's going to take it a second. Okay, so now I see that I've created 5,429 relationships, which is what I had on the slides before that we should expect. And I can see over here, I've got 5,429 and I have a relationship called sites. Okay. Cool. Now we have our database populated. Now, if you want to check that, what I'm going to do is I'm going to match a node. I'm going to match all nodes. In fact, I'm not even going to specify a node type and I'm going to match n return n and hit enter here. And what's going to happen here is we're going to get a visualization of our graph. Okay. And it's not everything here. It's, um, 
it's only going to bring in like 300 of them because graph visualization, as you'll find out, if you start getting too many nodes and relationships in, it kind of looks like a cat's hairball. <laughs> um, so the uh, this is just a portion of it. Um, we have Brian on Zoom asked, so, so the curly blade braces are for the attribute selection within some nodes. Yes. And in fact, we're going to search those nodes here in just a minute based on attributes. I'm going to show you how to do that. Okay, cool. We have a populated database. One of the things I'm going to tell you is that when you do these visualizations like I just did, um, it can sometimes take a fair bit of browser memory. So you might want to close this window. In order to do that, you hit this close button X that's all the way on the upper right. Okay, so I'm going to close it. If your browser starts running super slow and it happens, it happens frequently, just, just refresh the browser. Okay, but we're going to get out of the browser now. We're going to go to Google Colab, and I'm going to give you a minute to spin up a Colab instance. You're going to go to Colabs with, with a single L. I'm, I'm going to copy this into Slack right here. Okay, so um, you're going to go spin up a Colab notebook. Okay, so let me give you a second to get that spun up. While those are spinning up, I'll just remind you that um, my Zoom is having problems with looking at chat today. So if you have questions, I'd like to encourage you to bring them over to the Slack channel instead where I can see them. The Slack channel is working with data in a connected world, the power of graph data science. I know that's long. Go search um, for channel and just type the word working in there and it'll come up. Um, so um, the other thing I will tell you is that we're going to be um, bringing the repository into Colab. And um, what I would like you to do, um, I can show you the repository again here. Okay, it's, you know, if you're at GitHub, it's CJ2001 slash PyData21, or you can also go within the Slack channel. It is linked at the top of the discussion. Um, I am also going to copy it into the channel right now, just so we refresh our memories on it. So there it is. Okay. So now, now that you, now that we're in Colab, let's bring in the repository. Let me zoom in a touch here. And now I am going to go new notebook. Okay. Okay. I am going to say, um, let's see, where did it go? Um, this is silly. It usually gives me a link to bring it in from GitHub. Okay. Uh, okay, that's what we do. We are going to click File, Upload Notebook. Okay, so click File and Upload Notebook, and we're going to select GitHub here. Okay, now here's where you're going to need that URL. Last number was missing. Oh, uh, yep, yeah, sorry, I didn't copy in the whole thing. Thanks, Tanya. Um, okay, so we're going to copy in github.com cj2001 slash pi data 2021. Okay, click enter. And it shows me all of the notebooks within my repository. Um, what I recommend you do, just so we don't have to type the repository back in every time, um, I recommend that you open the notebooks in new windows using that, that square with an arrow button all the way on the right. The first notebook that we're going to open is called Intro to Cipher. Okay, so um these uh do we need to create an account on google colab and log in to create the notebook yeah you're going to need a google account um so now what we're going to do the notebooks are all available we're going to have to pick up the pace just a little bit here so we can get through all the notebooks they're all on the repository and they all have a bunch of comments in them so um first thing that we need to do is we need to install the neo 4j, 4J driver the python driver so i'm just going to click the run button right here uh oh the notebook was not authored by google oh, okay run anyway 
Okay, so this is going to take a second. Now, what you'll see um, in the repository, I keep the outputs of all of the cells, um, or I try to. And the reason for that is so that you can see what the output is supposed to look like. So if you're not driving along right now, that's totally fine. Um, you can look at the notebooks and see what we're going to get. Okay, so it's installed the, the driver. And now I just want to use pandas, and we're going to import this thing called graph database from that Neo4j uh python package you're just going to give it a run cool all right now we're not going to worry too much about this this is a class that i use to make the connection if you work with sql like sql alchemy or anything like that this is going to look pretty similar to like how you would use cursors within those packages um, i just created this thing here we're, we're not going to worry about too much about what it says okay now we actually need to connect to our database so we're going to go back to this UI here, which has our bolt URL and our password. Okay, and I'm going to copy the bolt URL. Okay, I'm going to go back here. I'm going to put it into this variable called URI. Okay, and I'm going to go back and I'm going to get my password. Copy it. And I'm going to paste it into the variable here, PWD. And using those two things, this is how we're going to establish our connection to Neo4j. So I'm going to run that cell. Gave me no errors, so yay! I think we've made a connection. But we're gonna we're gonna check. We're just gonna check. And um, this here is a cipher query. I'm going to match all of my nodes. Remember, round parentheses are nodes. And I'm going to return um, the count of those nodes. I've received a question. Can I know where? Can I show where to find the URI and the password? Absolutely. So this is sandbox.neo4j.com, and you need to click on connection details, okay? And that's where you get your bolt URL, which we call URI within Neo4j. Um, so you're gonna cop hit the copy button and paste that into the notebook, and then the password, also we're gonna copy and paste that into the notebook. Okay, back to our counting query, match n, return count of n. So this is going to just tell us how many nodes are within our database, and we want to make sure that it says 2,708, which it did. So that means we know we're connected to a populated database. Okay, let's look at now the um, what information is available on our nodes. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to match a node here. And I'm telling it that it's of node type paper. That's colon paper here. It's just how it happens in Cypher. I'm going to give it a variable name P. So P is of node label type paper. I'm going to return one node. Okay, that's that limit one here. And what I get here is I get this thing called a record and it's got properties. Remember the curly braces are properties. Okay, and those are long vectors. They're more than 400 dimensional. Well, they're 1400 dimensional, one for every word within our vocabulary. Okay, so I can see I have an ID. Now I'm going to point out here my ID is an integer, but we imported it as a string. Okay, so when we query things based on ID number, we want to make sure that we use a quote to indicate that it's string. And then I have a subject for this paper of neural networks. Cool. Okay. Kind of weird um, as Python folks to look at this record type. I'd rather look at it in a data structure that I know better. Um, so I'm going to do. Um, I'm going to return it as a pandas data frame. Now let me explain this query. I'm going to match a paper called P, and I'm going to return its ID as a column that I'm going to name ID. I'm going to return the subject as a column that's labeled subject. And the features, those word vectors, <clears throat> I'm going to return as a column called features, and I'm going to return five of them. Now, this is coming back kind of as a dictionary. Um, so I'm just going to create a data frame out of the dictionary of those queries here. So let's give that a run. And here I have a pandas data frame now. So that's cool. Um, can you show? Oh, sorry, we've done that question. Just as a reminder, where you find the URI and password is in sandbox.com. Click on connection details and get this Bolt IP address, and here's your password. Okay, now let's calculate um, how many instances there are of each class. Now, I've already told you that there are seven, but I'm going to show you how to do that. So I'm going to match all of my papers, 
And remember those papers each have subjects, okay? So I have some subject that's like neural networks or reinforcement learning, things like this. I'm gonna return the distinct values of those subjects, and then I'm gonna count how many papers had those subjects. So if, you, if you've worked with SQL, this should look somewhat similar to SQL. I'm gonna return it as a data frame, okay? Um, actually, let me give a head of 10 here so we can see them all. Okay. <clears throat> so um, let's see. So Cypher seems to be the Neo4j native language. I imagine there are some resources or tutorials to get familiar with the syntax. Absolutely. If you go into the README for the repository, there's links at the bottom and there's a ton of Cypher references there. There's also classes online. Neo4j has this thing called Graph Academy or just go to YouTube and search for like Cypher lessons and stuff like that. There's tons of classes out there. Um, subject are words and the matrix is the occurrence and the papers. Yes, um, the subject is, uh, they labeled, um, this paper is about neural networks, this paper is about genetic algorithms. So somebody labeled that. Um, and the, um, the matrix is the occurrence in the papers. Yes, so the, it's the occurrence of these 1400 words. Um, so sometimes those words occur and sometimes they don't occur. It's just the abstract, it's not the whole papers. Um, but yeah. So here I've got my subjects and I can see what my distribution is on how many papers are in our data set of those subjects. Now you see this is fairly imbalanced. We've got 800 papers on neural networks and we all only have 180 on rural learning. Guess what? We're just going to go with it. Okay, cool. So let's calculate in degree. Now what the in degree tells us is how many papers are citing my target paper. So a higher in degree means that it's been cited more times. So these would be kind of like the influential papers within the data set. So let me show you the cipher for that. Um, so I'm going to get my papers and I've got a size thing. Now here, let's look at what's inside the parentheses here. I'm saying some node, I didn't even call it anything. It doesn't even have a variable. It has the relationships of site to something that we're calling P. Okay, and the size of that is how many times that relationship exists to P. Okay, and we're gonna call that in degree. And we're gonna return the ID, the subject, and the in degree. And we're just gonna order it by decreasing in degree. We're gonna get five of them. So these are gonna be our top five papers. Okay, and here they are. There's a paper ID of 35 in genetic algorithms. It has 166 citations. When I was a professor, I would have loved to have seen that for my H index score. Okay, so we can look at in degree that way. And I'm going to cruise through these things. I apologize. We're going to go kind of fast. I encourage you to review these notebooks in the repository, you know, afterwards if this is of interest to you. Okay, now somebody talked about um, matching based on properties, and here's where we're going to do it. Okay, we're going to match some paper. It's citing some other paper, which we're going to call target. And I'm going to set where target ID, the ID of that target is paper number 114. But you'll notice I have quotes here because remember, we brought it in as a string and not as an integer into our database. And then I'm going to return the ID um, of P1. That's the papers that cite my target. Okay, so let's give that a run. Okay, so I have all of these papers are the ones that are citing um, my target paper of 114. Okay, cool. Now, here's one thing I'm excited to show you. This is for you SQL fans out there. And what we're going to do is we're going to find how many papers are within three hops of a target source. Okay. Um, in this case, we're going to use paper 114 again. So how many papers are within three hops? Think of this like the six degrees of Kevin Bacon game. How many people are within six degrees of Kevin Bacon? And um, what I get here um, is this, uh, look at this, uh, this is fun. I reverse the direction of my arrow. I can do that. I'm just drawing things, okay? And now I'm not even gonna specify the relationship type. I'm using this thing, square brackets of relationships. And what I am saying here with this asterisk and then one dot dot three is any relationship between one and three hops, okay? Think for a second about how hard it is to write that SQL query. It will take you a lot of joins, but it's also slow. Graph traversal is slow when you're writing multiple joins. SQL is slow with multiple joins. How slow? This graph traversal here is 
somewhere between three and five orders of magnitude faster. And look how simple it is. It's just a few lines here. So we're going to run it. Okay. And now I have how many, uh, these are all of my targets. Uh, my target subject is a paper in reinforcement learning. We knew that before. This paper here has a subject source um, of reinforcement learning as well. And all of the papers within this query would be within three hops. So that's pretty cool. All right, let's move on. Let's get into some data science here. Um, I want you to go back to um, our thing here where, where we were importing uh, GitHub. And we're going to start with Quora Word Embedding. So what this is gonna do, click on that um, pop out to a new tab button. Okay, I'm gonna close the other one. Um, okay, so I have this thing called Quora Word Embeddings. And um, I'm gonna import my notebook. And while I do that, um, let me tell you what we're going to do here is we're going to take those word vectors that Cora provided us with those one hot encoded vectors and we're going to create a machine learning model it's just going to be super simple it's not optimized for anything we're just going to create a support vector classifier we're going to use just normal scikit learn for it and see how well can we do. Um, in terms of accuracy. We're going to measure the accuracy of our ability to predict one of those seven classes based on the word vectors. Now, remember, I didn't create those word vectors. They might not be very well optimized, but we're just going to get an idea of what happens here. Okay, so my um, my driver package is installed. Got a bunch of packages here that are just kind of traditional Python packages. Just import those. I've got that same class that I used before. Um, and we're going to make our connection. Now, again, we're going to see this a few times. We're going to go back to sandbox.neo4j.com and we're going to get our IP address here. So I'm going to copy that and I'm going to paste it in here. Okay. I'm going to go and I'm going to grab my password. I'm going to paste it in. Okay, now we're going to make our connection and we're just going to count nodes just to make sure that we properly made the connection. You should see 2,708 nodes here. Okay, I'm going to use this opportunity to stop and suggest that if you have questions, bring them into the Slack channel, which is working with data in a connected world, the power of graph data science. Okay, because I can't see for reasons unknown. I can't see Zoom chat from my computer right now. It's kind of embarrassing. Okay. Now, um, we have some data formatting to do. Our goal is to get um, NumPy arrays out of our graph database. And, um, you know, we were storing things in strings before. If you actually look, those word vectors are stored as strings. So um, we have a little bit of cleaning to do on our data coming out of Neo4j. It's pretty straightforward, though. We're going to create a data frame just like we did before. Um, you know, so we're going to get the ID of the paper here we're going to get the subject of the paper and the features are those word embeddings and we're going to put that all into a data frame um, and I, I have to play some games here to get the um, uh, the features in out of a string of list into just list and then i'm going to create a new column here called embeddings um, and that's just turning our uh, word vectors into a numpy array Okay, and then I'm going to create, um, if you're familiar with scikit-learn, they create X and Y and they use capital X and little y. That's all I'm doing here is I'm creating my capital X and my little y. So that's all these functions are doing here. They're just little helper functions. Okay, now we're going to create our model. Okay, so here's our ML model. And again, this is not optimized. This is done just for the sake of demonstration and simplicity here. Um, we're going to do a five-fold validation, so k-fold validation. We already are, we're going to pull in our data frame and we're going to create our X and Y variables based on that data frame. Okay, and then we're going to do a train test split. This is just our normal, you know, scikit-learn train test split and I'm giving a test size of 25%. You know, that could be anything. I chose a smaller one just from the standpoint of this isn't a big data set. So I want to be able to get a fair bit of training in on it. Um, okay, and here's our classifier. We're using a support vector machine cl classifier. Um, 
And this class weight thing says to scikit-learn, try to balance the classes if you can. Okay, and then we're going to get our accuracy score back um, and we'll get the mean score. And then we're gonna plot our confusion matrix just so we get some sort of nice visual back. And we're gonna give this a run, it's gonna take a second. Oh, that's just, that's just creating the function, the actual modeler. Um, I'm deliberately not showing you the next line because I don't wanna give away the surprise. Okay, but let's run the modeler. Click on the run button. Okay, and this is gonna take a second. Um, you know, if, if you get an accuracy back here of 50%, that means that a, chip flim, a chimp flipping a coin can do better. So we wanna see an accuracy better than 50% on any of our machine learning models. Okay, let's see still running that's that's okay these these sometimes take a minute um we're used to that while it does i'm going to remind you of the github repository it's got the slides in it it's it has all of the data it has all of the cipher queries it's got the notebooks um and it also has a link of helpful references at the bottom so any minute now google any minute runtime was 58 seconds okay um in some of the in the case uh, that we have um limited time because we've got a little more than 15 minutes left i might just cruise through some of these notebooks and not actually run them okay um but we'll, we'll do what we can here okay so i see that we have a mean accuracy of about 72 percent here's my confusion matrix you know it's not bad it's not great, not bad, but you know we haven't done any optimization on the the word embeddings or on the actual um, support classifier model. Okay, now let's do this with a graph. So what we're going to do is we're going to go back to we're going to create a new uh, collab notebook. Okay, and we're going to open now Cora Graph Embeddings. Going to open it in a new tab. And close this other one just so we don't confuse Google too much. Okay, and like before, we're going to bring in our Neo4j package. Okay. And it's going to be just like before. Um, I'm going to bring in all the same functions. Um, one additional one, because we're going to visualize these embeddings here in a second. Okay, so let's import our packages. We're going to import our connection. Okay, we get to make our connection again. So I'm back at sandbox.neo4j.com. I copy my bolt URL as URI here. Um, my password, I go get that. Okay, here's my password. Um, it should say that I have 2,708 nodes. Okay, now I'm just going to click through these things here, and this is all the same stuff as before. Um, I just want to get the modeler starting to run. Okay, now in this case, let me show you what we're doing. Uh, I'm going to get an error here. Yep. Um, I forgot to do an important step. Okay. If you go back to the repository into that cipher queries, thing here, we have to do something very important. We are going to create what's called an in-memory graph. This is a graph projection um, where I'm telling the graph data science library what to do. Now, what's the graph data science library or GDS? GDS is a built-in library to Neo4j to do all of our data science calculations. So we're talking about some of the things that we could do before, like um, Louvain clustering, we could do node similarity, between the centrality, all of that. All of that is built into GDS. In fact, there's uh, more than 60 different data science functions that are built into here. But in order to make GDS run, what we are going to do is we're going to create this thing called an in-memory graph. Now, what the in-memory graph does is it takes a portion, whatever portion we tell it to, of our database, and it puts it into another space. It's a very efficient memory space where it's going to do the calculations. Now, one of the things that we have to do is tell it which nodes and re which relationships. We have a monopartite graph, meaning we have all the same types of nodes and relationships, and we, we're going to use the whole graph. Now, if you're not using a monopartite graph, you need to think about how you're going to do this. A lot of the GDS algorithms want a monopartite graph, so you're going to need to think about how can I collapse my 
my my multipartite graph into a monopartite graph. That's that's a more advanced subject. It's beyond the scope of today. We have a nice simple graph that we're going to create one of these projections of. Now, the other thing I will tell you is that um, a lot of GDS algorithms want an undirected graph. And if you recall, our direct our graph was actually directed. So we're going to tell we're going to tell GDS to turn it into an undirected graph, which basically means we should see double the number of relationships because what it's going to do is it's going to, if I have a relationship this way, it's going to duplicate it going the other way. Okay. Now here are lines 20 through 28 within our cipher, uh, the populate Cora DB file in the cipher query subdirectory. This is how we create the in-memory graph. So let me show you the syntax here. I'm creating a graph with a name called Cora. Okay, so I give the graph a name, and then I'm going to tell it what relationship types. Now, this could be a list of different, or I'm sorry, these are the node types. This could be a list of different node types, but we're not doing it that way because we only have one node type in this graph, okay, and that node type is called paper. Okay, I also could bring in multiple relationship types. We only have one, it's called sites. Now I'm providing a dictionary here that tells um, there are certain keywords that you can use such as orientation and orientation has a value of undirected. Um, how to do this is actually, you can find this more in my bite-sized Neo4j for data scientists, which is linked in the repository readme. But let's just give this a run really quick. So I'm gonna copy lines 20 to 28, and I'm gonna paste it into my browser, okay? And this is gonna create my in-memory graph for us. Give me a second. Okay, so here it is. You can see I've doubled my number of relationships as I predicted that we would. But now we're gonna use that in-memory graph to do all of our calculations on, okay? Um, one of the things that we're going to do, the most important thing we're going to do is create our graph embeddings. And we're going to use this thing called uh, FastRP. Okay, this is a very simple graph embedding technique. I was talking before how we're just going to randomly hop around the graph. Okay, and, um, and as we hop, we're going to see what other nodes we hit on these hops. We're going to do it a few times, and we're going to average them together, and that's what creates our embedding. Let me show you what they look like when we do that. So I'm just going to copy lines 31 to 38 into our browser. Okay. Um, one of the things I want to point out, remember I said that GDS brings things into its own space. It also creates its own IDs that don't correspond to anything physical, anything that we would recognize. So um, what we need to do for today is we're going to pull out our, um, this is bringing us out of that GDS identification into our normal identification. So um, we always, GDS always returns this thing called node ID and embedding. And so I'm going to say, give me the actual ID that we're interested in. That's our normal ID space. That could be a little confusing there. Okay, so here now what I have is I have my paper ID and I've got something that looks just like my embeddings from before. It's not one hot encoded like we had for our word vectors. Okay, but, but this, is, this is how we get our graph embeddings. So now I'm gonna run the line that failed here. And what I'm doing is I'm telling my modeler to give me a 256 dimensional vector. Okay, so we're gonna get, let that run. And let me show you here. We created our embeddings before. Okay. Um, did we create them? Uh, okay, here's actually where we're creating them is this function create embeddings. Um, and I'm calling the same function as before. You'll notice though that I'm calling this thing called write rather than stream before I called stream and what stream does is it just outputs the results to the browser screen, but when I use write, it writes whatever its calculation is to the nodes. Okay, now there are all kinds of hyperparameters for all of the things in GDS. I'm picking a few here. Don't worry about what they are. If you're interested, you can go into the GDS docs and read up more about them. I've also written some medium posts on them. Um, but what I, the big one here is I'm telling it embed, uh, embedding dimension of 256. 
um, and I'm telling it it's going to write a property. So the, those nodes are getting a new property called FastRP embeddings. Okay, and then we're going to go through all the same processes as before. And here's the result that I get. Now you remember when we did this with word embeddings, we got an accuracy of about 72%. But here, check it out. I got like 83% and I haven't even optimized my graph embeddings. That's pretty wild. Okay, that's pretty cool. All I did was took advantage of the relationships between these different nodes, these different papers. So that's, in my view, pretty cool. Okay, now what we're going to do is we're going to actually look at these embeddings and see if they make sense. Um, we had to map our classes before into um, numbers. So just um, if you're interested, here's what these numbers correspond to in this um, in what we're about to see here. I'm going to just create a normal TSNE plot of our data. Let's give that a run. Okay. It's going to take a second here. And again, um, I'm telling it that we're going to create um, a 256 dimensional. We're creating our embeddings, we're creating our X and Y, and then we're throwing those through TSNE. Okay. And um, and we're just going to see what they look like. Now, ideally, what we should see if we do some sort of dimensionality reduction like TSNE or PCA, we should see clusters. We should see our nodes like all of all of one node should be clustered together and all of another node should be clustered in a different space. And, you know, in a really cool world, they're separated by a lot. But let's see what they look like here. OK, all right. Um, I'm, I want to zoom out a little bit just so we can see this a little, see the whole thing. Okay, so what I have here are my red nodes. You can see are kind of scattered all around. Now I'm going to come back to why that is in a second. Um, I've got purple nodes, class five, and they seem to be clustered pretty well together. What's class five? Class five is genetic algorithms. Huh, okay. Um, what do I have here in these lime green ones? Lime green is class two. What is class two? Class two is reinforcement learning. Now, if you think about this, these are some pretty specific subdisciplines. So it would make sense that their papers would be citing each other. Um, but what about zero, which is neural networks? Those are the red ones. Well, neural networks, that's a pretty big, broad category, right? So a lot of a lot of papers are going to cite the big neural network papers because a lot of these other types of machine learning will talk about neural networks. So it would make sense then that the cluster associated with neural networks would be spread out over a lot of places and overlap. So, so when I look at a plot like this, I, I can kind of grok what it's saying here. You know, this makes intuitive sense if you think about what the underlying data is. Okay, so that's cool. Let's do one more thing. Can we overrun? Oh, we can overrun a few minutes if you want. Okay, well, we're not going to actually run this next one because it takes, this is the last notebook, and it takes a lot of time. So let's see if we can make it through. But thank you, Tanya. Okay, last one we're going to open here is called Cora Tune Embeddings. Okay, so any data scientist is going to want to take some time to really, you know, once you have a model developed, you're going to want to tune the hyperparameters of that model. And I'm going to show you how. I'm not actually going to run this today, um, but you, you can run it in your notebook just fine. Okay, now we're going to be using a library called Optuna. If you're not familiar with Optuna, um, if you want to win a Kaggle channel challenge, you should be using Optuna to tune your hyperparameters. Lots of these winners do. Okay, so again, we install our usual packages, including Optuna, we make our connection to the database. Okay, just like before, we create our X and Y variables, we have our model, and again, just for the graphs, just for the sake of comparison, I'm still using that same really basic support vector classifier model. I haven't changed anything, so I'm trying to do as much of an apples to apples comparison as possible here. We return the accuracy score just as we did before. But now um, we've got this thing called an objective, and this is how Optuna works, is you create a test. Um, you do many trials through this test, and Optuna has a way of mathematically trying to play around with your different hyperparameters to optimize what you tell it to optimize. So in this case, I am optimizing four hyperparameters associated with FastRP. And you can go and look up what these things are, um, but I'm optimizing the embedding dimension, I'm optimizing some weights, um, normalization strength, um, and um, Let's see, we're telling it to do this uh, right here. 
Okay, so whatever, um, whatever value it chose to try out for these things is getting thrown into FastRP, writing it to the database. Now here, I'm saying that we're gonna try integers for embeddings between 32 and 512. So it's gonna try embedding dimensions of like 32, somewhere to 512, and it'll pop around a bunch. Okay, here's where I actually run my study. I give it some initial parameters, just kind of heat it up before it goes, warm it up. Okay, and so it'll run a whole bunch of trials. This is what it looks like. And it, I told it that it needed to optimize based on accuracy, and I told it that it should maximize accuracy. Okay, so we could scroll down to here, and here's what we get. Once it found what the optimal parameters were, um, this is what it looks like. You get this plot. Each blue point here is showing you, here's what my accuracy was for this particular run. And what we see, the best value that we get of accuracy is 86%. Okay, that's 15% greater than what we got when we were using the word embeddings. And it's like 3% greater than what we got without tuning the embeddings. That's pretty impressive. Okay, so then I can also look at which parameters dominated that solution. And by far, the one that dominated was the embedding dimension. You'll want to tinker around with this for your given model. There's all kinds of other ways within GDS that you can create graph embeddings, and they all have different sensitivities to different hyperparameters. They all have different hyperparameters. So, um, so that's cool. Um, we can visualize those embeddings just like we did before. It looks kind of similar because, you know, those hyperparameters didn't change much from what I gave it originally. So, yay. Um, okay, it's time to wrap up. So let's go back to our slides. And here's what we learned today. We learned why graphs and why, why not just SQL. Now, I am not going to tell you that graphs are the end all and be all and the only way that you should do things. Okay, some SQL can get you some very good results, but think about how you might have relationships within your data because you can absolutely take advantage of those. Now, one of the things you want to think about though is that um, this is going to work best if your data is very tightly connected. So like I have a lot of nodes. If I have two nodes over here and two nodes over here and three nodes up here and, and whatnot, those random skips around the graph are not going to work. It's going to be kind of like ping pong, this node, this node, this node, this node. So those embeddings are not going to be very meaningful. How do you know if you have a graphy problem? We talked about lots of SQL joins. Um, we talked about some graph theory. We did some machine learning in some code. And then I said, we're going to wrap up. So I want to remind you of the two key concepts, the two things that if you took nothing else away from today, I want you to remember. So the first one was that it can be good to break that assumption about the rows being uncorrelated. Okay. Um, we have seen examples of that today where the, the individual data points are correlated and our assumptions, our machine learning assumptions about the independence of each data point were broken. Second, Modeling relationships can result in models that are less noisy. Think about that. We had NLP is very noisy. It's hard. That's why you have NLP experts out there. But the graph, the relationships between those two papers or those multiple papers is not ambiguous. It is significantly less noisy um, when we looked at this problem that way. Okay, I want to just say thank you for attending. We are at time. It is 30 after the hour. This is how you can find me on the internet is through Twitter. Um, and I also post a lot on Medium about the concepts that you saw today. All of those things are linked on the GitHub repository. And with that, we're going to bring it to a close. So thank you everyone for attending. Thank you, Tanya. Thank you, the organizers of Pi Data. I hope you got something out of today. So enjoy the rest of the conference and we'll see you out there.